הרדיו הבינתחומי בשידורים חיים ורעיונות מיוחדים. מהכנס השנתי של ICT, המכון למדיניות נגד טרור. Welcome everyone, this is IDC International Radio 106.2 FM and we find ourselves in the midst of this year's 14th annual summit of the Institute for Counterterrorism here at IDC Ertelia. And this morning we had um, the legal workshop, uh, which is part of, of a multi-year project um, which has been uh, organized and led by um, the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism at Syracuse University and the Institute for Counterterrorism here at IDC Ertelia. And this work, the workshop this year was devoted to analyzing um, the legal response to an, an evolving threat and an expanding battlefield. Um, and we have with us four very distinguished speakers today to have this roundtable on the counterterrorism threat and the legal response. Uh, particularly, I think we'll focus right now on the United States and how the United States will be facing this evolving threat on an expanding battlefield. Before we talk a little bit more about today's workshop and the insights that it may um, have and the implications it may have on how we view um, the United States' upcoming uh, uh, strategy or actions in this expanded battlefield in Iraq and in Syria and in the fight against ISIS, I would like to invite Professor Bill Banks, who's been leading the New Battlefield Old Loss project for many years, um, to share with us some of what this project is about and why it's so important. Thank you, Daphna. In 2006, during the Second Lebanon War, I was here at ICT uh, giving some instruction in the executive program. And during the war, uh, conversations with Boaz Ganor and others, our students, we, uh, we lamented the fact not only of the ongoing conflict, but that the, the good guys, the IDF, were roundly criticized in world opinion and in the media for responding to the asymmetric attack that came from Lebanon by seeking to rout out the insurgent fighters in Lebanon in the urban areas. Uh, they were being criticized for the collateral damage or harm to civilians that was sometimes caused in an operation to get at the insurgents. Because the Israeli army was following the laws of armed conflict, we knew that they were behaving lawfully. And we also thought that they were uh, keeping the highest moral ground. But in the opinion of the world, it was easy for them to be criticized, uh, showing images of, of uh, apartment complexes with uh, burning uh, window openings, for example. We determined after consulting with American and other colleagues that uh, we should undertake a project that began to explore asymmetries. What happens in asymmetric conflict when the, the state parties who are, have always been governed by the laws of armed conflict, what we call international humanitarian law, are up against adversaries, non-state actors who are not parties to those agreements, the treaties that we abide by, and who, through their own battlefield tactics, seek to violate those very restrictions that they know their state enemy will follow. So the asymmetry gives benefits to, if you will, the bad guys, and we on the good side not only have to uh, continue to fight by respecting those traditions, but we have to overcome the effort of the adversary, the non-state adversary, to use those laws to their advantage. Mm -hmm. So this project now, since 2006, we're in eight years and counting, has uh, been designed to consider the new battlefields and adaptations that may be needed for the old laws. By old laws, we don't mean to uh, say that the standards that the state parties have been abiding by are outdated. Uh, indeed, they remain very viable and are very effective in most cases at protecting civilians against harm. But because of asymmetries, adaptations may be required to modernize those laws and their interpretations to account for this new form of battle. So we've been working. We've been having a series of workshops. We've uh, published books, as you know, a number of articles and papers, blog posts, commentary, and uh, leading to the 2014 version here today. 
Wonderful. Um, so I'd like to present also um, your and my esteemed colleagues who, are, who have joined us today, Professor Laurie Blank from Emory uh, School of Law and Jennifer Daskal and Professor Nathan Sales. It's a pleasure to have you all here with us. And um, before we get a little bit more into the insights that we, that we could um, learn from today's workshop, I'd like to ask you um, a question which is kind of a threshold question. Why is it important, essentially, what the law might be saying about these asymmetric threats, and why is it important to actually engage in this kind of discussion um, when we face a threat like ISIS, which the United States has actually admitted to not having a particular strategy, a well-defined strategy yet to, to counter this threat? Shouldn't we be focusing more on strategy and policy before the law becomes the topic of conversation? I think... I don't think you can put one before the other. I think this is a, you know, any situation of a state seeking to counter a threat, whether it's from another state, whether it's in the public health realm, whether, what, domestic, whatever it is, uh, has many complexities. Uh, it has the, the challenge of what action would be considered effective, what action is possible given resources, what action is lawful given either domestic or international frameworks. And I don't think you can think about any one of those in a vacuum. I think to to start by analyzing the law and then say, well, now we know what the law is, so let's pick a policy that works. Uh, that's, that's probably the most backwards. Um, we lawyers like to think that the law is, of course, the primary driving force, but it's, it's not. Um, it's a tool. Um, it's a, a means for figuring out how to act. Uh, but ultimately, I think policy and strategy are going to be based on what's effective. Mm -hmm. Then that must be lawful because the consequences of illegality are not just criminality, but much broader than that. Uh, but we have to think about them all together. So I, I agree with that completely, although I would add in this context, there's an additional element, which is there has been a very active debate in the United States about the potential authorization to use force against ISIS. And in this particular context, I think it's essential that policy has to come first. So there needs to be a policy determination as to the scope of um, the engagement that the U.S. would like to get involved in, and then there needs to be an authorization to give the executive, the president, the authority to engage in the types of actions that the executive determines are necessary to counter this threat. So while I generally agree that policy and law are intertwined and have to be looked at hand in hand, when we're talking about something with respect to author the authorization to use force, the first step is figuring out what is our policy with respect to this particular group? Are we talking about a situation where we're dealing with an organized armed group for whom other potential counterterrorism mechanisms are not sufficient and a determination? Are we talking about countering this threat in Iraq? Are we talking about expanding the conflict to Syria? And then once those determinations are made, then one can design an authorization that gives the executive the appropriate authority needed to carry out the mission that the president as commander in chief determines is necessary. Another important reason, I think, why we're focusing on law in addition to the broader strategic questions is because legality brings legitimacy. Right? It's important not just for military force to prevail on the battlefield, but for military force to prevail in a way that complies with relevant international and, and domestic laws. And not just actual compliance, but, but apparent compliance as well. Not just following the law, but being seen as following the law. Um, so legal principles can inform uh, the manner in which uh, military operations are carried out with an eye towards sort of winning in the court of public opinion, uh, sort of beyond traditional military objectives. Um, very good. And so as uh, Professor Blank was saying, lawyers like to think that they are indispensable and the most important and perhaps even law uh, perhaps even useful. So I'd like to ask you what, for each, uh, each of you, what would you say is one valuable insight that, um, that can be learned from this morning's discussion in the New Battlefield Old Laws Workshop, uh, perhaps as we look uh, forward to the, the evolution of these threats and the potential responses to them? Well, so well, maybe we'll try to start with you. I, I think one important insight is how seriously American policymakers take the law. 
Um, mm. America is a very legalistic culture in general, and that emphasis on legality permeates our military culture, our intelligence culture as well. Um, I think law regulates what is done in the United States, uh, counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and, and other military contexts, far more than in, in many other countries. Um, Israel is another great example of a country that takes legal compliance incredibly seriously. Um, there are costs to this. Right? If, you're, if you are rigidly following the law, um, international law, domestic law, um, the law operates to constrain. right? But there are certain important benefits that come from legal compliance as well. Um, not the least of which is giving you the moral high ground um, when criticized by adversaries, uh, as Bill mentioned in, in previous conflicts, uh, for, for committing war crimes or uh, overreach. Well, if you're complying with the law, it, it sort of operates as a shield against those sorts of accusations mm -hmm. um, and provides you with a basis to, to push back uh, on those making rather extravagant claims about what the law requires you to do when, in fact, you're already in perfect compliance with it. Any other insight? I, I think um, it's particularly interesting to discuss these issues in an international context. And uh, in the United States, we often forget that we're not the only country that is dealing with terrorist threats or national security challenges. We're so big, we, we, we tend to drown out much other discourse simply with the amount of debate that we can have inside our own borders. And it's really useful to uh, discuss the challenges another country faces, to hear from individuals in that country, in third countries, uh, those who have a range of perspectives, not even about uh, the rightness or wrongness or, or appropriateness of certain action, but simply different presumptions that might drive the analysis to begin with. And I think that's extraordinarily helpful uh, to inform how we all think about this. Another thing I think we've learned uh, through our series of workshops is that asymmetry is even more prevalent in 2014 than it was in 2006 when we first started. Uh, with the possible exception now of a state conflict between Russia and Ukraine, all the conflicts in the world are essentially asymmetric. Mm -hmm. And the form that we began to study eight years ago and that others have studied since uh, is now dominant and as Lori said we can learn so much from each other just by gaining an appreciation of the perception on conflict from inside different cultures. And just the one other piece that I would add to that, add to that is not only are asymmetric threats um, pervasive when we look at the types of conflicts that exist in the world today but that asymmetric threats differ from one another and that it's essential mm -hmm. to consider the context in which they arise, the nature of the non-state group that one's dealing with, questions about whether or not they control territory, and a whole host of other issues that need to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis and that no two conflicts are, are, are identical. Um, so, so thank you, thank you for that. And and I'm, and I want to go back now a little bit to the U.S. context since we're like to be U.S. centric a little bit. Um, we're waiting with anticipation for President Obama's remarks tonight and potentially the expo, you know, uh, for him to expose his vision and his strategy for dealing with ISIS and the potential return of the United States in Iraq and in Syria. Even though with all of what that means for President Obama, who's been so reluctant to do so for so many years. Um, I'm wondering, do you think that as um, in the current legal environment uh, in the United States, do you think that the president currently has sufficient legal authority to use force in Iraq and potentially also in Syria, or is anything else necessary for him to be able to do that? Well, it's my position. I mean, so, so at least for, according to the previews of what the president is going to announce tonight, it's like, it seems as if, or at least reporting suggests, that he's going to announce a decision to continue to potentially escalate um, the use of strikes in Iraq and also potentially to expand into Syria. It's also my understanding that he's going to continue his promise not to commit ground troops in either Iraq or Syria, although um, it, it, it seems likely that there would at least be some special operation forces operating in one or both nations if, if the predictions are accurate. Um, so it's my strong view that he ought to be going to Congress to seeking authorization for this conflict, particularly with respect to Syria, if, as is expected, he does not have the consent 
consent of the of the Syrian government, which raises a whole host of international law as well as well as domestic law questions. Yeah, th so, in addition to the legal reasons to seek congressional authorization for whatever the operations end up being, um, there's also PR reasons for doing so. Um, congressional approval uh, provides an important level of top cover for the president. Um, it shares responsibility, allocates responsibility for the decision to use force uh, among a wider group of people, um, which means that if operations turn out to not be as effective as hoped, um, the president is able to share blame uh, with members of Congress who, after all, were the ones who egged him on. Um, so from a self-interested standpoint, you know, the, uh, any administration uh, has to face a particular tension. On the one hand, um, legal authorization will constrain us, um, and it's time-consuming and costly for us to get congressional approval. But at the same time, if we do obtain it, it provides, as we talked about before, you know, an air of legitimacy that otherwise might be lacking. And, and from a self-interested standpoint, also helps us uh, if things turn out not ideal, um, we're not the only ones you know, holding the bag. But, but you know what? I wonder how could he not go to Congress? Because with Syria, when Syria came about, then he left the decision essentially to Congress to be, uh, to be made and then really took himself out of the equation by doing so. So is there really a way that he could adopt a different course of action this time around? I think just to you know, uh, flesh that out a little bit, I think there's a difference here between uh, the certainly from the international law context, the nature of the use of force that was proposed or considered last summer, um, which had to do with using force essentially to punish the use of chemical weapons, which are outlawed under international law, but, but that in and of itself doesn't factor into the international law that justifies a state using force against another state. It's simply, they're, they're, they're apples and oranges, in essence. Here we're talking about a state using force against a non-state group, although one that fancies itself a state. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as I know, fancying yourself a state as yet doesn't make you a state under international law. Um, that's, that entity is operating at least in two states, as we know. One of those states has given the U.S. consent to take action. That is the international law basis for the use of force in Iraq. The question is that f that group extends across the border into another state. What is the international law apparatus for determining whether you can for use force inside that other state. We, we clearly, as far as I know, don't have Syria's consent, unless there's something going on behind the scenes we don't know about. Uh, it's not clear we want to seek Syria's consent. That's a very Definitely. complex and uh, potentially dangerous political game to play. Uh, so it raises a really interesting question that has been raised in debates, certainly in the policy and, and academic communities, about if you're in a conflict with a non-state group and that's, that group is operating now across the border from where you're engaging in conflict with them, is that sufficient to get you across the border, so to speak, in an international law frame to use force against that group but in another state's territory? And I think that's a really interesting question. It's separate from the domestic law authorization. We really have two layers here. So it sounds like you're, so the, it all depends on whether the United States determines that it's at war with ISIS or whether it's, so, uh, the determination is based, basically is this a group determination or is it based on a territory uh, or the state at, with which uh, it would be at war on the territory of which, of whom the, the war would take place. So if you're saying it's against ISIS, then theoretically you could go against ISIS both in Iraq and in Syria and potentially also in another state that ISIS uh, might find itself in. So uh, and the other, the other point that I that I that I want to raise after hearing what you just said is that it seems that it's once again about Syria, and perhaps not about as, about Iraq as much as we have been hearing. Because if with Iraq you you're saying, and I agree that we, there is a legal basis under international law to act, then uh, because of the consent of the Iraqi government, then the question is, okay, so we're back to square one. We're back on Syria. So again, I mean, I think. I think there's two layers, as, as Professor Blank just said, there's the domestic law layer and there's the international law layer. And as a matter of domestic law, the, uh, the, the use of force in Syria or Iraq 
absent congressional authorization has to be justified under some sort of self-defense theory. And so the actions that the United States has engaged in in Iraq have been justified as in defense of U.S. personnel in Iraq and also to some extent defense of others. Mm -hmm. um, and if the United States were going to expand into Syria, it would have to offer a similar justification with respect to actions in Syria as a matter of domestic law. Um, in order to con in order to have a legal basis for acting under domestic law absent congressional authorization. Even if there's a domestic law authorization that doesn't answer the international law question that Professor Blank was talking about is what provides a justification for essentially violating the sovereignty of Syria in using force against um, ISIL in Syria if the Syrian government doesn't consent. And there, there's a question as to whether or not either there's a, not, there's a, a self-defense theory with respect to international law that kicks in, or there's an argument that once you're in an armed conflict with a group that crosses borders and the state here Syria is unable or unwilling to deal with the entity, then that would also potentially provide, according to one theory, a justification for using force in Syria. Do, do you think that the United Nations has any role to play in this? Do you see a role for the United Nations in uh, this next step in, uh, in the next Iraq war? I mean, and ideally, I see, I see a role for the Security Council, mm -hmm. um, but that is, um, for a whole host of political reasons, not particularly likely in this context. Do you... Do you Jen, think that there is a self-defense argument to be made with respect to U.S. and Syria? Um, it's hard to answer that question without having access to the full intelligence. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's probably pushing the outer limits of what would be permissible under a self-defense theory, which is why I have argued and continue to argue that it's much preferable for the United States to go, to, at least as a domestic law matter, to go to Congress and seek authorization. And then there needs to be another analysis with respect to the international law issues. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Sales, do you want to add anything? You're good. Okay. Did I look like I wanted okay. to? No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I want to thank you all very, very much for this analysis of what is a very timely topic. And I think I will definitely know more uh, when we hear from President Obama. But I think... Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> That's also true. Uh, in any event, uh, this demonstrates the importance of holding this kind of workshops in the middle of a counterterrorism conference. And I think if... Um, if I, I think I remember correctly that uh, what one of the unique characteristics of these workshops is that they bring together people coming from legal academia as well as people coming from the uh, uh, being more on the operational side of things. And uh, this is something that we don't see very much. So we encourage you to continue and do that uh, here at IDC Ertelia. Thank you very much for listening to us on 106.2 FM. Radio Ben Tchumi Bishidurim Chaim Verayonot Miuchadim. מהכנס השנתי של ICT, המכון למדיניות נגד טרור.